Hey, it's Art from Minor Microphone. In today's video, I would like to share with you what I believe to be 11 worthwhile questions to be asking yourself when mixing. These come from a longer list of questions that I like to ask myself when mixing, and it's my hope that by sharing these with you, I can help spark some inquisitiveness on your end and help you improve your mixes. So we won't be diving into any digital audio workstation today. Rather, this will be more of a conversational video, but I believe that it will be worthwhile nonetheless. So let's get started with question number one. Question number one to ask yourself is how well is my mix session organized? Now, when we are mixing, it's important to have as smooth an interface as possible between what we hear and what we think and the actual mix session itself. So that when we hear issues or hear things that we want to get done in the mix, we can quickly get in the mix session and get those things done. Now, personally, I like to set up all of my mix sessions as similarly as possible, even if there are different track counts and different tracks themselves. And so I think that it's paramount that you find a system that works for you and to set up and organize your sessions similarly so that you can quickly get what's in your head into the mix without having to go and find the different things that need addressing within the mix session. I do have a video dedicated to mix preparation and organization. I'll leave a link to that one in the description box down below if you're interested. Question number two to ask yourself is how long have you been mixing for? Now I'm not talking about how many weeks, months, years have you been mixing for professionally or as an amateur. Rather, I'm talking about how much time have you been spending in this particular session mixing. The truth is that our ears will rapidly adjust to whatever it is we are listening to. And if you combine that with ear fatigue that will set in if we are listening at levels that are a bit too high, then you can understand how taking frequent ear breaks can help reset our objectivity and get us back with fresh ears into the mix when we return. So personally, to reduce ear fatigue, I try to not mix for longer than an hour straight at any given point. Of course, sometimes we will get in the zone and push far beyond that, but it's still important to factor in the amount of time that we've been mixing and to take that into account when we are making our mixing decisions, knowing that we may be losing our objectivity as we go further and further into a single mix session. Question number three to ask yourself is how does my mix sound in mono? Now it's important to get a strong stereo image in our mix, a nice wide stereo image. And in today's climate, even getting a strong Dolby Atmos or surround sound mix. However, many playback systems, including our smartphones, many club PA systems will play back the music in mono. And so it's paramount that we get a mix that translates to mono or a mix that is mono compatible. So personally, while I'm mixing, I will have a simple plugin that can collapse my mix bus down to mono and I will regularly check my mix in mono just to make sure that I'm not losing a bunch of information and that I'm not having significant phase cancellation from the stereo image when it's collapsed down to mono so that my mix will translate well to mono playback systems. I do have a video dedicated to mono compatibility. I will leave a link to that in the description box down below. Question number four is similar to question number three and that is how does my mix sound band passed? By putting a bandpass filter on the mix bus and focusing our efforts on the mid-range, we can get a stronger sense of how our mixes will translate to all different playback systems because certain playback systems will be better at producing the very low end and others will be better or worse at producing the very top end, but most should be able to produce that mid-range. And the truth is that our hearing is the most sensitive to the mid-range, and so if we can really nail that, then we can nail the mix. So personally, I like to test my mid-range by having an EQ that I can toggle on and off on my mix bus. That EQ will have a 12 dB per octave high pass filter at 200 and a 12 dB per octave low pass filter at about 4000 Hertz so that I can quickly toggle that EQ on and off to focus my efforts on the mid range just to ensure that the bass elements like the kick drum, bass guitar, bass synth can be heard in that mid range and that I'm not losing too much information by rolling off the top end. This way my mixes can better translate to poor listening environments like cell phone speakers. Now moving on from the mid range we have question number five which is how consistent is my low end? Now having wide dynamic range in the low end frequencies can be a little bit uncanny and it can be a little bit distracting when we get to systems that can produce those low end frequencies really well. And so it's worthwhile to ask yourself how well those low end frequencies are tamed within the mix. We can use multi-band compression, focusing on those low frequencies to tame them a little bit more than the mid-range and the higher frequencies. We can also use limiting to control the low end in some cases. But the key here is that if it helps the mix, which it often does, then we should pay attention to taming those low end frequencies in our mix. And so that's why this is an important question to ask ourselves when mixing. Question number six is how well do the vocals blend with the music? Now, in almost all cases, the vocals will be the most important element of the mix, and so it's important to have them stand out within the mix. But we can quickly get into cases where the vocal sounds a little bit too removed from the mix, 
or conversely, it is too blended with the mix. So it's important to strike that balance where the vocal still sounds like it is part of the overall music and mix while still standing out from the music in the mix. There are plenty of strategies for mixing and producing vocals. I'm actually working on a vocal production course at the moment, which I will leave a link to in the description box down below once it becomes available. Question number seven is how well are my drum shells balanced? Now, much like the vocal, the drums are another very important part of modern music and modern production. And so it's important to get these elements right in the mix. Having a kick drum that is much louder than the snare or having toms that are much louder than the kick and snare can sound rather uncanny in a mix. And so it's important to hone in and get the balance of our drum shells as consistent as possible in the mix. Of course, we can use automation to bring drums up and down in the balance of the mix throughout different sections. And we can also use automation to boost certain fills so that they stand out a little bit in the mix, but it is still paramount to maintain a strong balance between the drum shells in the mix. Question number eight is, are there any issues in the sibilance range of the mix? Now this mostly applies to vocals, but it can also apply to other instruments as well. The sibilance range is where a lot of vocal intelligibility lies. It's where a lot of S type sounds tend to peak and they can be very piercing if not tamed within the mix. And so we can use DSing, which is effectively multiband compression to tame just those peaks to help bring down the harshness of the sibilance within the mix. Overly sibilant vocals can be very distracting and very harsh in the mix, especially when the mix is turned up to high volumes. So this is something to be aware of within our mixes. Question number nine is how dynamic is my mix? Now, a lot of modern music is very heavily compressed to reduce that dynamic range, but it's still nice to have those dynamics, not only between the sections, but within the sections themselves. So how much are your drums punching? How dynamic is the vocal? And how will these dynamics translate to the mastering stage? These are all questions that are worth asking yourself when mixing. Now, every song is different, so I don't have any hard rules for you here, but it still is important to ask yourself how dynamic the mix is to at least get your mind thinking about dynamics within the mix. Question number 10 is how can I use automation to enhance my mix? Now, getting a great, strong static mix is super important, but to really get a professional sounding mix, we need to use automation to bring levels up and down to bring different effects up and down and to control the parameters of such effects to add some movement and excitement into the mix. So how can we use automation within our mixes to make them more exciting? Well, first we can rebalance elements in the mix through different sections, bringing them forward or backward within the mix. We can use it to bring up embellishments or fills within the mix. We can use it for effects throws and to control the different parameters of our effects to give a little bit more sonic interest and much, much more. I have a video going into detail on how to use automation. I'll leave a link to that in the description box down below as well. And question number 11 is how does my mix compare to my references? Now, when we start a mix, it's important to choose a few reference tracks that are in a similar style or genre that we can quickly toggle between to compare our mix against as we move through the mix. These reference mixes are typically professionally mixed, commercially released songs that act as a sort of goalpost for us to work toward in our own mixes. And so it's important to periodically compare what we are working on to our reference mixes just to make sure that we're in a similar ballpark. Of course, we do want to make our mixes sound unique and we don't want to get into a situation where we are basing all of our decisions off of what the reference mix sounds like, but it is still very important to compare our mixes against what's already out there just to make sure that, again, we are in that same ballpark. I have a video going deeper into the importance of reference tracks, which I will also leave a link to in the description box down below. So those are my 11 worthwhile questions to ask yourself while mixing. If you have questions that you ask yourself regularly while you are mixing, please leave them in the comments down below. I'd love to get a discussion started on this topic. And if you would like to learn more about mixing more generally, please feel free to pick up your free copy of my mixing guidebook. It will be the first link in the description box down below. Sign up to my newsletter and I will send that to you right away goes through my entire workflow to help you ask the right questions at the right times and do the right things at the right times to get better results out of your mixes. So once again, first link in the description box down below. If you found this video to be useful, please hit that like button. If you'd like to hang out with me more here on YouTube, please feel free to check out one of these videos in the top left or top right corner to hit that subscribe button. And I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.